The world is my office. That's what I always tell people when they ask me about where my office is. You may not realize it. We are all part of this work workspace revolution. Technology facilitates remote working, nurture a new kind of human machine labor relations, and redefines a corporate culture. What's in store for us in the future? Let's find out from these revolutionaries. So, Christine, Max, and Michael, first question for all of you. You are the revolutionary. You are the change agents. You initiate change when most of us may not get it yet. So, could each of you name one major obstacle when you initiate change? And at that point, how did you overcome it? Start with Christy. Great. Hi there. Uh, I used to manage the software investments for a, a fund at Goldman, and once I had children, I realized how impossible it is to balance being a mom, a good mom, as well as being uh, retaining my professional identity. And I struggled to find uh, a job that would allow me to work from home while my kids were at school. So I had to <laughs> create an entire company mm -hmm. so that I could do that, as well as enable other moms to do so. And now we have employees in nine states, primarily moms, who work from home while their mm -hmm. kids are at school. Mm -hmm. and when you work between school drop-off and pickup, and after the kids go to bed, um, your professional life is kind of visible to the kids, and you're just a great mom to them. Hmm. So, Max. Uh, well, um, I run a company called WorkFusion. We're in a space of called, that's called robotic process automation. Essentially, we have uh, created software robots that take over white-collar jobs, right? So back office loans and so forth and so on. So obviously there's a stigma of a robot taking my job. You guys read about it every day and, you know. Uh, but uh, when you deal with, with enterprises, you know, capitalism is great. Is you know, sort of the, uh, the objection of having a robot take over uh, somebody's work sort of kind of drowns out in the business case itself. So, you know, as long as there is a good business case, uh, the corporations are willing to uh, mm. accept change, and I think that's what's sort of driving more investment and more innovation in AI and companies like mm -hmm. us is because the corporations are really funding this. Yeah, so we're uh, Video is a video experience platform, and uh, we help businesses communicate with video, whether that's through marketing, sales, or internally. Um, and it's pretty clear that video is a thing. A lot of people are using video to communicate on a regular basis, whether that's with consumer apps um, or even consumer companies marketing to you. Uh, we talk about the video, which are people who are coming into the workplace who have access to recording devices and are communicating and experiencing video on a regular basis. So we're helping businesses try to think along those lines. Um, and I think a lot of companies are scared of this next generation mm -hmm. of employee coming into the business mm -hmm. and not understanding how to communicate with them. So the way we manage change in these organizations is primarily by eating our own dog food um, and playing into the fear of these mm -hmm. companies. And so um, we have a, a global organization. We've got people at our headquarters in, in Waterloo, Boston, Vancouver, um, soon to be Barcelona. And one of the things we do on a regular basis um, communicate with the team, me as a leader, my go-to-market leaders, my product leaders, using video, using our products. Mm. And a lot of the times when we're talking to companies, um, we'll do the exact same thing. Um, because video for us is a really great and easy way of communicating comp complex ideas. So I think for us, the, to assimilate it into you know, one line is uh, we eat our own dog food. Yes. Now, um, Max and Michael, you... Um, I think you rightly point out uh, you, you rightly point out about the fact that you actually when you talk to companies, you explain to them the, the, the benefits and you know you know the, the CEO, the senior managers, they obviously you know they have the vision, they understand what's going on out there. You know, convincing the management team to buy into uh, your idea is one thing, but engaging the operational people to embrace the change in another thing. So I would like to hear from both of you, like in your work examples before, what's your experience in working with the, 
the, the, the ground people, the operation people, and you know what kind of experience you, you, you uh, what kind of experience that what kind of insight you could draw from that experience. At the end of the day, you want to engage everybody, and um, is 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 not just the the, the senior management dying, but also the mid level people. We will start with you first, Michael. Yeah. So um, I kind of mentioned that what we play into is this executive level of fear that they're not going to be able to communicate and engage this next generation of employee inside of a company. And so um, the way we kind of uh, engage those employees and those people inside of the company um, is actually by a flywheel SaaS model um, in that we've built a product which is free to use um, that enables people inside of a company to communicate with video. It's a, it's a Chrome plugin. You can record um, yourself in front of your webcam or on a mobile device, or you can do a screen recording and then share that inside your company on, on Slack, on Facebook at work. Um, via email, and you get a notification when the recipient views it. It's a free product, and so often what will happen is while we're pitching the organization at the executive level on the benefits of using this product, there's already people inside of the company using this piece of software. It's, it's called Viewed It, hundreds of thousands of users uh, globally. And so um, what we often do is just connect the dots. And when we're having that executive discussion, there may be already a bunch of people using it. Um, if we are having that executive discussion and there aren't, we will find champions inside the organization and penetrate them with the technology so that we can bridge that gap. Mm. And we're very similar mm -hmm. uh, to what uh, Michael said. So essentially, uh, usually we start out with a CEO, chief operating officer that has a vision of reducing or increasing efficiency and reducing headcount through uh, these AI robots, right? They want to introduce robots into the enterprise. And uh, you know, I think by the latest counts, about 70% of every corporation, knowledge corporation, with the banking, insurance, healthcare, manufacturing, consists of people of work that is fairly repeatable and can be automated with uh, technology like WorkFusion by uh, robotic process automation. So uh, at that point, you know, we get engaged with the operations team because this is where most of the headcount re reside. And you know, in the top-down scenario, the, their targets have been set for automation. So they're very receptive in implementing WorkFusion because their targets are set and they have to increase efficiency, not only reduce headcount, but increase efficiency, make things, you know, robots work 24 seven, they don't look at Facebook, they don't make mistakes. <laughs> uh, you know, they're very happy, you know, they, because they, they have, have so emotion. many. Yeah, of course. I mean, if I'm processing mortgages all day long, you know, humans make mistakes. And so they're happy to bring robots in. And then the other, uh, the bottom up strategy is, uh, we also have a free product that allows uh, non-tech people to create robots, mm -hmm. you know, some simple robots. It's called RPA Express. And we allow people to download and go through Automation Academy where you learn how to use them and actually create robots that automate some of their work, mm -hmm. right? So that sort of makes it less scary because you understand how, you know, the robots work and then maybe they help you in part of your job and not really take away your job. So, and then at that point, it's a bottom-up strategy where uh, there is an upsell to a larger suite, uh, which is called smart process automation. So I could use your product to build a robot that spends time on Facebook for me? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's free, RPA Express. Right now. now um, in my view, like, you know, for a change case or change management to be successful, uh, it depends on two things. One is willingness. Now, just now I asked you about not just the willingness of the top management, but also the operational people. Let's say you solve the people issue. The issue is skill. You and I, Max, talked about this yesterday. I used the term called wake up call. We could call in terms of given the rise of AI, the um, technology advancement disruption, people, regardless of their age, they need to upskill and reskill. And you, you use the term called uh, force function. Um, could you explain that to us and how you foresee this human intelligence combined with artificial intelligence? So it's a very good question. I mean, it's a big reason why uh, we started company. I was a researcher at MIT C-Cell Labs, and I happened to go on a sabbatical and uh, visit India, where they have a lot of these, I don't know if you know, big centers for outsourcing. It's called business process outsourcing. So it's a lot of people performing this repetitive type of knowledge work. And I thought, well, how come there's thousands of people here? I thought that technology automated this a long time ago, and then we 
sort of went back and decided to apply artificial intelligence to solving this problem. And you know, the big idea for me has personally been elevating human intelligence uh, to the point where you don't have to perform this uh, sort of manual labor and can focus on higher tasks and higher type of uh, solutions and, and creativity and so forth. But knowing that humans are inherently lazy <laughs> and inertia is there, yeah. and there's a saying that says, change will only occur when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And we, I see the company uh, as a forcing function uh, for the education, you know, continuous education and continuous, continuous elevation of human intelligence uh, in the workplace and in, in life in general, because what WorkFusion does, it basically eats up at the jobs that are lower and middle tier of the corporation, right? That 50 to 70% of jobs. And that really is the forcing function. I speak a lot in front of sort of the educational community and they're like, well, how come, you know, we have all these great courses and technology, how come people are not really registering and coming over? And said, so just wait and see, because we're making that push uh, for them to have the thirst to educate because it's only going to happen when they're uh, the jobs that they're sort of used to doing that are not as stimulating are going to start disappearing and that's is that the automation academy you're trying to build i, I read about this uh, in your um you know in the news yeah um, this is our attempt to sort of start creating new jobs I mean, you know we don't want to be just taking away jobs and people are asking us well you know what are we going to do and what type of jobs and i just had a round table we talked about this you know for, for a long time so one of the jobs that are going to be, and it's a new type of jobs that are going to be out there, is really creating managing robots, right? And that's, you see this in manufacturing. And uh, Automation Academy is our way to be able to educate the community of how to work with uh, software like that to create robots and, and, and requalify, essentially, from the door to the robot manager. Right. So human, robots, new kind of labor relations. Now, Christine. You, um, your, the change you have initiated, basically you link remote, highly qualified remote workers and spe specifically women, mothers, um, in other locations with startups with uh, small and medium-sized companies. You basically try to tap or tap into the untapped potential of this, these um, talents. Could you tell us how you use technology to empower these mothers who can bake the cake, but also eat it too. That's right. Uh, we are focused in the compliance industries, uh, industries that are regulated by government uh, organizations like uh, the Department of Labor, uh, the IRS. And so it's interesting, we built actually a whole lot of software to standardize the work that we were doing. And for the most part, we automated away most of, of the low end of the work. Uh, we ended up bringing some of that back because uh, the business owners that hired us to own a function, like the CFO function, which is comprised of payroll, HR, tax, accounting, and so forth, they actually wanted to talk to us. They were looking for business advisors uh, and customer service people rather than just robots to actually you know, deb do the debits and credits. So it's been interesting. And we built software over a number of years, assuming every single participant workforce was in a different location and it's a very different perspective. Uh, we, take, we don't take for granted uh, the water cooler talks. We assume there's actually zero and every single person is in a completely distributed uh, situation. So it's been a lot of work, a lot of learning and it's working um, and we are, because we're focused on the actual human judgment around the coordination of many functions that are often disparate and compete with each other mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, blame storming as it comes to the space that we're in because you can go to jail if you don't do certain things right. So uh, it's been uh, quite a journey uh, in developing the technology to enable this remote distributed workforce, mainly of moms who operate in from the perspective of asking permission rather than seeking forgiveness later and kind of like that very different personality of the women mainly that we employ versus the clients that are kind of the hunters versus the gatherers um, has been, taken a whole lot of, of work to get right. Right. Um, yesterday, when you and I kind of talked about this, you used a term called uh, Hollywood model, uh, ho Hollywood model, the, uh, the, the movie model, in terms That's of right. how you see this workplace 
situation will evolve. Could That's you right. share so, with us here? So when I started uh, working uh, in the early 90s, it was really about finding a company sponsor who would invest in you that you can commit to over decades. Mm -hmm. And you'd get a pension, there'd be a training program, and that's the way you thought about work. That's no longer the case. I mean, the training programs have disappeared, and I noticed that the younger generation of workers kind of uh, had the perspective uh, that work was much less this um, for life commitment, and businesses were more like Hollywood productions, where experts descended on a project with a finite duration and a very scoped role, and once that was over, it's over, and you go move on to the next project. And the relationship and the loyalty you feel is really towards the community of the people on the team rather than the actual federal employment ID number associated with the company. And again, we built software assuming every single person uh, working on that team could be uh, to has, is in a different location as well as parts of different organizations. So the line be between internal, external, employee versus contractor becomes very blurred and producing a, a ops engine to take into consideration those two factors was actually not easy. Well, technology obviously solves a lot of problems, like I said, facilitates remote working, but also redefines corporate culture. Now, Michael, you're the culture guy, so you, know, um, <laughs> you share with me a lot about how you build and maintain the work culture for your staff member, um, not just like you know, across different offices, but in each of those diff uh, local offices. Yep. How did you do that? Yeah, um, I have so many thoughts. Uh, so I love, I love that Hollywood analogy um, because I think that's absolutely true. People come into a workplace without the vision that they're going to spend five or ten years there. Um, however, at Vidyard, we have a ten-year vision and a mission and a journey, and so we need people committed to what they're, they need to do. And, um, we appreciate that uh, work has changed, right? And there's a lot of things in technology that have made it much easier to work. And, and the, the productivity of being human is exactly that. It's, it's being human and being creative. And so um, ultimately what we've really tried to do is, is define a workplace culture, um, which isn't necessarily based on cultures. Culture is really hard to define. It's actually based on values. Mm. Um, and from a very early age, and I don't know what stage everybody's company is at in this room, um, we actually defined our values, um, four core values of the company um, that we hire and fire against. And um, those core values are a reflection, I think, of my, my co-founder and I and the reasons we started the company. Um, and now we're about 250 people. Um, as we get bigger and busier and it gets harder to, to tangibly manage those individuals and, and know them all intimately as we once did. And I think Gary uh, Vaynerchuk talked about this on day one and the importance of, of knowing the, the needs and necessities of each of your individuals. The, this values layer is actually what um, defines uh, how we work. So what we do is we, we actually map everybody on a values and performance graph. Um, and so if your values and your performance are very high, so your alignment is there and your performance is killer, then you're someone that we want to keep. Um, obviously, if your performance is poor and your values suck, then you're not going to stay at Vidyard very long. Um, if you have really high performance and really poor values, mm -hmm. that's something that we actually will refer to as cultural cancer. So that's someone that erodes <laughs> the organization. Um, it starts with the person and spreads. And, and learning from experience is something that we really um, had to eradicate early. So um, those people, we move out of the business. Um, the last category is if your um, performance is low, but your value alignment is high. And what we do is, is invest in those individuals mm. on the basis that you can coach on performance, but you cannot coach on values. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as being a human and interacting with humans is the only real competitive advantage to being a human, value alignment is the most important thing in, globe, in building a scalable culture. Right. Um you mentioned before about like uh, you, you have three offices. Um, yeah. I believe like um, Toronto, uh, Boston, and um, Vancouver. Vancouver. That's right. So you mentioned about localized culture. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So a lot of people try to like define their culture in a statement or in a phrase or a really long paragraph or a document. The problem is um, people on the East Coast have very different working habits than people on the West Coast do. Um, same thing goes for Canadians versus Americans versus Europeans. Um, and so we have to be respective of that. 
um, and anticipate that uh, people have lives outside of work. And work-life integration, I won't say work-life balance, work-life integration is, is a very important aspect of, I, I think, today's life. And so be, because we're so focused on values, um, what we can do is allow each organization to build its own localized culture. Mm. Um, and the reason that's important is because if you're going to go work at the Vanyard office, which is what we call Vidyard Vancouver, um, it needs to be reflective of the local culture. Because mm. if it's a very East Coast style, you know, wine and grand type company, everybody's in at eight, leaves at nine type of style, you're not going to be able to recruit from that local talent pool. And so you need to allow the culture um, I think to, to propagate in that specific region. Right. So, Christine, like since you you mentioned the remote workers and also the the so-called home office, what's your client's experience in terms of keeping up with this so-called corporate culture? I mean, I, I love your concept of localizing the culture by office. Uh, in in our experience, the 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 culture of of parenthood is, is somewhat global. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I do as CEO of the company is I note in my calendar, which the entire company can see uh, everywhere, uh, exactly when I am dropping off my children, picking them up, when I need to make it to baseball uh, tryouts, to the ballet recital, and that permission to actually be a good parent has to come from the top. I mean, we work our butts off and we cover each other. Uh, while I'm doing this today, uh, please cover me and I will do that for you tomorrow while you're doing that. And that type of camaraderie and having uh, each other's backs while you are fulfilling your duty to society to produce great, responsible children is a, a very important part of our culture. We are parents first. All right. That's now awesome. we only have one minute left. So very quickly, three of you. Given what you know about this workplace revolution, you know, we definitely involve more and more machine and technology and all that. Give one piece of advice for our professionals, workers here, in terms of how they could position themselves um, in terms of career development. I think there's a misconception that there's fear with uh, jobs being automated away. In our experience at Higher Athena, uh, the professionals that we employ are thrilled not to have to do uh, rote work and actually be able to look up and add value as advisors to businesses. So um, don't be afraid of the automation coming down the pike because no one can totally replace the human judgment required to do a good job. Yeah. Max, you're the scientist. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I agree. You fear what you don't know. So I suggest you learn more about the topic of robotic process automation or intelligent automation to actually actually see what software like WorkFusion can automate within the workplace, and then you can draw the conclusions, you know, where you would like to invest your time in education and mm -hmm. sort of uh, focus on educating yourself uh, along the lines of higher level tasks. Yeah, I think for me it's continuous learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're in a job, if you're in a job where it's very clear that automation um, could potentially put you out of a job, it is your responsibility as a human. Um, that wants to be productive and contribute to the world to figure out what you can do. And if you have a skills-based role that you went to school for five or 10 or 15 years ago, um, it doesn't matter anymore. You have a responsibility to yourself, to your family, and to the world to continuously innovate and manage those skills so that you can continue to be a productive member of society. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to our uh, session. Thank you. Thank you.